Hello, everyone. My name is Jerry Rackley. I'm the Chief Analyst at Demand Metric, and we are glad you have decided to join us today for our presentation on the impact of brand consistency. Uh, this comes from a study we have just completed and are publishing this week. And a fundamental principle of growing a brand's influence is to ensure that it consistently is presented in all the ways and places that it appears. This principle is the reason many organizations are zealous guardians of their brand and its image. They develop precise standards for rendering it. They restrict how it's used, and they even take legal action against abuse of the brand. When brand standards aren't enforced, damage to the brand can occur, causing a loss of brand equity. It's smart to protect and manage the brand in this way. So Demand Metric and Lucid Press partnered to take these beliefs about brand consistency and explore them more deeply. Today we're going to share with you what we learned in the study we've just completed. And what we learned confirmed some beliefs, it refuted a few others, and in general it gives us some insights about how important maintaining brand consistency really is. And if you have uh, attended some of our webinars in the past, you know that I typically don't do these alone. I am joined today by the sponsor of our research. And let me introduce uh, that sponsor to you. Of course, you have me, Jerry Rackley, as chief analyst there on the left. And I'm joined by Luke Langford, who is VP of Product and General Manager at Lucid Press. So, Luke, I want to say first thank you for sponsoring the research and also for joining me today to help present it. Hey, thank you, Jerry. Uh, it's uh, great to be here and uh, have really appreciated uh, working with Demand Metric and your team to, to do this important research. And important, I think it is, because uh, I do a lot of these studies, but this one really stood out in my mind in terms of some of the things we learned. So let's talk about uh, what we're going to share. Uh, here's our agenda. Just very briefly, let me show this to you. We're going to talk about what a brand is and, of course, the, the impact of inconsistency and why it matters so much. Uh, we'll share the key findings from our study, including some advice, takeaways, and resources that we have for you. And you can see at the bottom of this agenda, there's a time for questions and answers. And so I want to encourage you right now, uh, as you look at this webinar, if you're listening in, you can enter your questions. There's a, a question area in the console. We won't answer those as we go through the presentation, but when we get to the end, we'll look at anything you've entered, questions, comments, compliments, criticisms. We'll take whatever you wish to share. So I encourage you to do that as we go through, enter your questions for us. So before we jump into the findings, Luke and I have a couple things we want to share. And the first is this. I think everybody has a fundamental understanding of what a brand is. And there's some great quotes here on the screen about what a brand really is. And we all understand as marketers that a brand is way more than just the logo. There's a lot more to a brand than just the logo and its visual identity. And so we want to just set the record straight from the very beginning that uh, we know what a brand really is and how expansive it is in terms of definition. So with that said, what I also want to share is that the scope of our study, we limited deliberately. Uh, we looked specifically at the way a brand is presented, its visual identity. And these are things like colors, logos, fonts, and things of that nature. So just so you know uh, what we did in terms of scope. That's, that's when we talk about brand today in our presentation, that's what we're talking about, okay? So let's just talk about inconsistent branding, all right? I'm going to put a slide up here and let Luke talk to you about it. You can decide. Any harm done here? Yeah, no, I, thank you, Jerry. I, I love this slide, and, and for those of you here, if you look at it, it, it probably makes your brain hurt a little bit, but I think this is a great illustration. Uh, if, if you're someone out there who's skeptical and thinks, mm, I'm not sure I'm influenced by brand or presentation doesn't really affect me, um, as a consumer or as someone who's on the receiving end of brands, I think you can't help but look at these images and have almost an emotional reaction. It feels wrong. It feels different. You look at it and you think about Walmart and everything you might associate with them, but now it's in the red target spot and it's confusing to you. What should you associate with that? Does it have the, the sort of uh, Target... 
uh, a slightly up market kind of fashion association with Walmart, which is cost and value, uh, and, and the flip side for Target. Uh, so I think I think this this image really helps to me drive the message home of why presentation matters so much, because as you present your brand, your customers, your consumers, your audience does make associations with it, conscious and not. Uh, and when you do a sort of reversal like this, uh, I think anyone can can feel that and, and agree that it's there. You know, Luke, this is a great slide. This is a slide you contributed to our slide deck, and I love it because you're right. This is such an outrageous violation you know, of brand standards. We look at this and we just go, oh, that's so wrong. So now let me show you another one. This is a slide that I put together. And so here we have a couple other brands, right? And so in this case, um, you know, we've, we've made some changes to the way a couple of very famous, well-known brands are rendered, but they're a little bit more subtle. And, and really, the point I want to make on this is, is, is a little bit different than what Luke just made. Uh, let's take a look at the IBM logo, which is rendered in you know some shade of purple or magenta. And you know, perhaps we have an employee who is participating in an event on behalf of IBM. And the theme of the event is this color purple. And so the employee thought, you know, there's really no harm done. I'm going to create a purple rendering of our logo. It'll go great on the event program. And uh, or, or likewise, someone you know looks at the Apple logo and says, I'm just going to do a mirror image of that. And for for whatever reason, right? And so we look at these and we recognize immediately. All right, these are not standard, uh, you know, renderings of this the, either of these brands but it's a little bit more subtle in terms of the way they violate standards. And, and my point is, even as subtle as these may seem, they can still do a lot of damage to the brand. And so that's really what we're about here today, is talking about what's the impact and uh, you know, what are some insights to manage the brand so we don't suffer the consequences. So uh, to kind of set the table for the rest of our discussion, I want to ask Luke to come back in and just share some thoughts about this study. Great. Th thank you, Jerry. Again, Lucid Press uh, is, is a design and layout platform. It's a web-based application that allows anyone to, to lay out and create uh, digital and print materials and collateral. And uh, the reason we, we wanted to fund this study was about a year ago, uh, we had a, a senior marketing director of a large hospital group reach out to us. He, he'd come upon Lucid Press with someone who used it uh, for himself and some of his team did. And, and he said, you know, he reached out and said, I have, I have a problem, I have a challenge. Brand matters a lot to me. And, and if he were on this call, he could talk to you for an hour about the colors they've chosen and the little wave and watermark in it uh, and how that was evocative of life and the symbolism of healing, which was important to the, not only the hospital and the health care they wanted to provide, but also their heritage as, as initially being a, a Catholic-founded institution. And, and all of that mattered deeply, and he was the steward at his company to make sure that that was presented well and presented consistently. Uh, but he found that he had such a hard time policing it, and not even policing in the bad way, but just even equipping people to know what to do and how to do it well. Uh, you know, in, in a hospital group, like many businesses, there are many, many people who have the power to create documents and, and present them in places where customers and consumers could see them. And, and so he, his, his approach was to have a design team uh, that, that would take requests, and the illustration, what you see here on, was, was really what he was frustrated by, is that, you know, uh, that the event coordinator doing events in the community would send something to the design team, looking out a couple weeks for when she had some deadlines to get some things mailed or published. The design team, always overburdened, would say, well, it's really, really not something we can fit in. Can you give us another week? She'd get frustrated. They'd get frustrated. Um, and, uh, and the result was lots of back and forth and lots of iteration and people not working their best and things getting in the way. And, and the message he said was, look, Luke, people don't wait and they can't wait. They need to get their job done. And as much as my team wants to provide them with a service to get them the content and the collateral they need to do their job, it's just so challenging. You know, could your tool help with that? Could you make some modifications? And that, that, that set Lucid Press on a journey to adjust our product to really be a platform that lets marketers and, and brand stewards 
set up a content platform to allow for the creation, control, and, and distribution and customization of content. But, but as, as we began to do that for him uh, and his institution, uh, we, we thought, well, we, we really, we ought to, we ought to research and see what, what's going on here and, and how, how often are these issues prevalent uh, in, in the lives and work uh, of, of marketing directors and, and teams and corporations. And so that, that's really what set us out kind of on this thought journey uh, and that ultimately ended up you know, finding you, Jerry, and asking you to help us do some research. Um, the other thought, as we reflected, that really encouraged us to do this w was, uh, was what you see here uh, on this slide 10, uh, the, the then versus the now. Um, a lot of the, the principles and the foundational thinking around branding came, came and grew up in an era when, when things were a little simpler. Uh, corporate HQ used mass media to get to a mass audience. And, and a lot of the brands that in fact are absolutely iconic today, the Coca-Colas of the world, the McDonald's, um, that was how they became iconic, was being the first to get out there and master the use of those channels. Um, we don't live in that world today. Today, with the advent of technology, you have distributed workforces, many, many people in companies who have both the power and the need to do their jobs to create and to do things that represent the brand in physical and digital material. Media is distributed. You've got web, you've got social and local print in addition to those mass channels, which are not as important as they used to be. And the audience is fragmented too. And so those those factors all, you know, we think have changed the environment in a way that, that makes brand consistency all the more challenging to do, still as important as it ever was. And uh, and that's really that's really what led us, Jerry, to, to want to sponsor this research to really understand how important is this, how is it being done today, and uh, hopefully arrive at some helpful learnings that people can use as best practices to uh, to, to do well by their brand. Well, and I remember the first conversation we had about doing this study, it was a topic that really resonated with me as well because I feel very strongly about the importance of uh, maintaining brand consistency for many of the reasons we're about to talk about. And so let's get to that and uh, share with you what we learned. And before we do that, I want to issue a word of thank to the people who are listening in who actually participated in the survey. The data that we get is invaluable. It lets us share findings with the marketing community at large. And so if you're one of the folks who took our survey, we're grateful for that. Uh, let's talk about the report. Uh, here is a cover photo of the report, and this report is available. I know the folks at Lucid Press are going to make it available through their website, and I believe you can also visit the resources area in your console to download a copy of this report. But we'd sure like for you to get your hands on it. Everything I'm about to share with you comes right out of this report. So it is available to you. And let's begin with an overall assessment of brand visibility. We started our survey by asking the study participants to assess their brand visibility at a macro level by just sharing how visible their brands are in all the places and all the ways in which their brands are used and for all the markets that they serve. And so as you see in this chart, there's a nice even distribution of responses from virtually unknown on the left to excellent visibility on the right. So if you're a statistician, you look at the uh, shape of the bars and you go, oh, good distribution, and it is. When I analyzed this brand visibility data a bit further, I found brand visibility differences based on the size of the study participants organization. So let's look at those differences. And you, you might want to guess before I advance to the slide, who enjoys the best brand visibility? Small companies, medium, large companies? Well, here's what we found out. We used annual revenue as the company size metric. And so here are the same categories of visibility from the previous slide, but now I've broken them into company segments that you see listed in the chart. So just so you know what these segments are, small organizations were those with 24 million or less in annual revenue. Medium organizations were 25 million to 499 million in annual revenue. And large organizations were 500 million or more in annual revenue. So most of us probably assume that larger companies enjoy greater brand visibility. And based on this data, they absolutely do. 
Now, we could debate whether brand visibility results from company size or company size results from brand visibility. Now, when you look at the cause-effect dynamic, revenue is almost always an effect. And since that's what we're using to gauge size, we think that the cause and effect relationship is uh, the brand drives the revenue. And what we see in this chart is that brand visibility is clearly one of the causes of this effect. So that this relationship exists is not really a surprise, but what I thought was pretty eye-opening is the difference to which brand visibility increases in larger companies. You know, on the right side of this chart, the excellent visibility, 63% of large companies uh, versus 12% and 10% for medium and small. Pretty big difference there. The visibility a brand enjoys is in large part a function of how consistently a brand is presented in all the places that it appears. So we're showing you that consistency data in this chart, and you can see the range goes from very inconsistently presented on the left to very consistently presented on the right. We measured this consistency in our study, as well as how brand presentation consistency impacts visibility. And I'll share that with you here in just a minute. From this chart, we see that brand presentation consistency does skew toward the consistent end of the spectrum, and that's a good thing. In fact, almost half of the study participants indicate that their brand presentation is consistent or very consistent in all the places the brand appears. But here's what we have to recognize. The goal is very consistent presentation of the brand. That's what everyone should strive for. And less than 10% of our study's participants hit this level of consistency. Now, the study data analysis showed a strong relationship between a brand's visibility and how consistently a brand is presented. We're not surprised by this. We expect to see this. What may surprise you is the degree to which consistency impacts visibility. That's what this busy chart is showing us, so let me try to explain it. To produce this chart, I've segmented the responses that we got into an inconsistent segment, and so that's the darkest orange color. Everyone from the previous chart who responded with very inconsistent or inconsistent brand presentation. The neutral segment are those who said their brand presentation consistency was, of course, neutral. And the consistent segment, that's the lightest orange shaded set of bars, are those who indicated either consistent or very consistent. So those are the segments. Here's what we see. Those who report that their brands are consistently presented are three to four times more likely to enjoy excellent brand visibility than those in the inconsistent or neutral segments. And that's the uh, set of bars on the right. I've drawn a box around it and indicated that multiplier three to four times. Um, we want our brands to have excellent visibility. And we know from this chart that ensuring consistent presentation of our brands impacts visibility in a huge way, three to four times based on this data. With this finding, you would think that everyone would conclude that presenting the brand consistently is a high priority, right? Well, we asked, so let's see how important our study participants said it was. And here's the chart where we graph that out. Almost everyone in this study, 86% thinks it's important to present their brands consistently in all the places people might encounter those brands. And that 86% is the sum of the important and very important bars on the right-hand side of this chart. An organization's view of this importance does indeed influence brand presentation consistency, as those who say it is important or very important rate their brand presentation consistency more than twice as high as those who think it's very unimportant to neutral. But when it comes to visibility, where the brand rubber meets the proverbial road, the previous chart shows us that while many aspire, few attain excellent levels of brand visibility. So as we continue our discussion, we'll explore some reasons for and impacts of these brand consistency issues. 
A brand is far more than just a logo. I like to think of a brand as a trust mark that conveys a set of implicit and explicit promises. The strength of a brand can expand or limit its role in some crucial activities related to the revenue cycle. And we're showing that in this chart. Along the y-axis is a, is a list of some pretty common activities that the brand influences. Uh, and we once again have created segments in this chart. These are brand consistency segments of either consistent or inconsistent. And that's the extent. What we're showing here is the extent to which the strength of a brand lets it play a major role in some of these activities. And so really that was the question we asked in our survey is, um, you know, what extent does your brand play a major role in any of the things you see listed on the y-axis? The consistency with which a brand is presented turns out to have a lot to do with the kind of influence the brand has in these revenue cycle roles I'm showing you here. Rarely is a firm's brand benign when it comes to doing these things. The brand either helps or detracts in these roles. The gap between the inconsistent and consistent brand presentation segments for the roles shown here average 20%. That's a pretty sizable gap. A consistent brand presentation expands the influence that the brand has in these particular roles. Now, the consistency with which brands are presented has a lot to do with the control that firms have over their brand. Specifically, who's responsible for managing and protecting how the brand is used? And which people are able to create or modify branded materials? We looked at both of these aspects of brand management, and we started with primary management responsibility. And that's what this chart shows you, again, in consistency importance segments. The uh, consistency where it's important, that's the darker orange shaded set of bars and consistency being unimportant to neutral, the lighter shaded set of bars. Here's what this chart teaches us. It teaches us something about who should manage and protect the brand if consistency is important, and that's the CMO or the CEO. While it seems unrealistic for a CEO to serve as brand manager, when the CEO recognizes the importance of managing the brand, it sends a very clear message to everyone that the brand is an asset worthy of protection and investment. Now, Luke, I know that when we started looking at the study data early on, you kind of had uh, some thoughts about this, so I want to ask you to share those thoughts. Yeah, no, I, I, I love this slide, uh, in, in part because it resonates, right? It's, uh, it's, it's so clear from other evidence and, and this research that you've done, even what we've seen in the past couple slides, that people agree that brand consistency is important. And yet so many companies struggle to make sure that their brand is presented consistently to increase the visibility and improve it. And, and I think one of the roots of that is, is that uh, it, it doesn't start at the top in many organizations, right? Uh, and, and certainly uh, often it does uh, in those organizations that do think they're able to get consistency and that it is important. Uh, but in many organizations, it's not the top uh, that is running that. And I think if you think about the, the brands that all of us recognize that do such a great job with consistency and have built such a strong brand, it's not hard to also think of leaders, Apple and Steve Jobs, who was fanatical about messaging and was deeply involved himself in the messaging around the iPod and how it was a thousand songs in your pocket. And, there, and there's a number of examples out there. Uh, so it's very clearly, I think this does resonate and, and, and convey that senior leaders need to take an interest in this. They need to set that tone and they need to expect others beneath them to help them do that. And it also represents the challenge. Uh, there are so many things a CEO needs to do, so many things a CMO needs to do. Uh, policing the brand is often not the first thing that comes up. And so it represents both the opportunity of what needs to be done to do this well, uh, but also the challenge and, and, and how do you get the right tools, processes, culture built to go do that. So I, I thought this was a very, very interesting finding. Yeah, we, we just can't uh, have the kind of consistency we want if leadership's not part of the equation. And, and your example with Steve Jobs is a very good one because he was a fanatic about the brand. Um, so great observation. And let me just pause here and, and remind everyone again, we do want your questions or your comments. In, in fact, if you have experiences 
uh, relative to managing the brand and, and issues with inconsistency, and you're willing to share those, those are very useful for all of us to hear. So feel free to do that. And as I said, when we get to the end of our presentation, we will take those questions. So let's continue on. Let's answer that second question about who. That is, who can create or modify materials? When it comes to managing the brand and ensuring consistent presentation, one of the age-old challenges we have is simply the number of people who are able to create or modify branded marketing, communication, sales materials. I remember I worked for one organization where marketing literally would not distribute uh, its logo, the company logo, uh, outside the marketing department just because they, they didn't trust that people would you know, deal with the brand properly. This chart shows what we learned about this freedom to use or abuse the brand. And as I did on the previous chart, I'm showing this data to you by brand consistency importance segments. Again, where consistency is important, the darker orange, and where it's not, the lighter orange. So who can create branded materials varies by the importance of brand consistency. Probably not a big surprise, but the data certainly proves that out. When brand consistency isn't important, it's far more likely that anyone is able to create branded marketing, communication, or sales materials. But even when consistency is important, this still shows that a lot of freedom exists for various parties to create branded materials. And this freedom isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it does open the door to inconsistent presentations of the brand. Employees and business partners generally don't take creative liberties with the brand with the intent to do it harm. However, the liberties they do take, usually in the name of expediency, can introduce inconsistencies that ultimately diminish or weaken the brand. So this abuse of the brand isn't intentional, but the damage is still very real. And Luke, I know again you had some thoughts on this I'd like for you to share. Yeah, you know, this this slide just shows how everyone every company needs to allow people across the organization to modify materials. I mean, you you see some skew in this of the companies where consistency is important to to live and and implement more controls, uh much much like the example you shared of working in a company where they wouldn't share their logo. Uh, today, uh, if you don't share your company's logo, your, com your, your employees are just going to go to Google and they're going to search my company logo and that's what they're going to use. Um, and, and in fact, it's funny, um, in, in putting together this presentation, uh, we traded a couple of iterations, Jerry, you and I, where you, you did that. <laughs> you went and Googled Lucid Press's logo and we went through a rebrand a couple years ago and you used our old logo. Um, not a big deal. It just illustrates how easy it is because people feel like they're empowered. They need to do their jobs to do this. And, uh, and so there's, there's no getting around that. You can try to restrict it, but sometimes those restrictions, uh, when, you know, just, just result in people going rogue if, if you don't, if you don't do it in the right way. So, uh, again, I, I thought this was, was very interesting to, uh, to underscore that with the findings here. Well, in your example of the difficulty we had just putting this presentation together with the right logos, something as simple as that, Imagine when it's a bit more complex how easy it is for inconsistent, you know, brands to be presented to, you know, the audience that you're trying to influence through that brand. So, uh, again, uh, great observations on that. Uh, and, Luke, I know you have some other things to share as we continue through here as well. Let's take a look next at uh, guidelines, branding guidelines. And, and not just the guidelines, but the enforcement of those guidelines. That's what I'm showing you here. And it really is unrealistic for a CMO to exercise absolute authority over the presentation of a brand. And by that, I mean requiring every single use to be approved and exercising complete creative control over the brand. Maybe it's uh, unrealistic isn't the right word. Maybe impractical is a better word. But while to some marketers... That may sound like the utopian brand management environment. It just isn't practical. And so for this reason, most organizations have intentionally created a set of branding guidelines to document standards and to provide boundaries while also helping to regulate or enforce their use. So we see here the status of branding guidelines in the organizations we survey. The good news, 94% of study participants have some form of branding guidelines in place. 
Uh, almost everyone has some form of branding guidelines, even though enforcement of those guidelines varies. That's what you really see in the top three or four bars of this chart. The prevalence of branding guidelines is encouraging, but do they work? And I'd also like to point out that the existence of branding guidelines isn't really a secret because if you look at the bottom bar on this chart, just 1% claim to not know of the existence of branding guidelines. So simply because guidelines exist, however, is not a guarantee that they're going to help create more consistent presentation of the brand. More practically, do branding guidelines have an effect on the creation of non-compliant marketing communication or sales materials? We asked questions in our survey to find out the answers to both of these questions. Let's take a look. Regarding the first question I just asked, do branding guidelines work? And by work I mean, do they help produce consistency? This chart shows us that they do. So. Um, Again, we've got some segmentation here, so let me refresh you on that. But this chart shows the status of branding guidelines by how consistently the brand is presented. And so to refresh you on the segmentation I used in this chart, inconsistent is the brand presentation being inconsistent in all the places it appears. Neutral, the brand presentation is neither inconsistent nor consistent in all the places it appears. And then consistent. The brand presentation is just that, consistent in all the places it appears. From this chart, we see that branding guidelines do indeed impact the consistency with which a brand is presented. When formal guidelines exist that are enforced, the firms that have them are more than twice as likely to see a consistent presentation of their brand. In short, branding guidelines work. So what about the second question I asked? Do branding guidelines have an effect on the creation of non-compliant marketing communication or sales materials? Well, let's see. To answer the second question, we asked our study participants to tell us how often marketing communications or sales material is created and deployed that does not conform to brand consistency guidelines. When looking at the problem of deploying materials that don't conform to brand standards, we wanted to know how frequently this problem occurs. So what our chart is showing through the lens of branding guidelines is the impact these guidelines have on how often non-conforming materials are deployed. The percentages for each, are the, or each bar are the sum of the never or rarely responses. So let's take a look at the top bar. When you have formal, consistently enforced guidelines, 58% say they never or rarely have this problem. That's the way to read the chart. And look at the delta between the top two bar sets, 20%. It's very difficult to completely prevent the creation and deployment of rogue materials that don't conform to the guidelines. In this study, just 10% of participants shared that this problem never happens to them. What we see is that when formal guidelines exist and they're consistently enforced, well over half the study's participants rarely or never have this problem. Minimizing the escape of non-conforming materials isn't just a matter of having guidelines. The level of enforcement is also a key determinant in minimizing this problem. Besides their existence and enforcement, there are other dimensions of branding guidelines that come into play here, such as how current are they? How easy are they to find? How easy are they to comply with? All of which impact the bottom bar in this chart, how effective they are. This chart shows how branding guidelines rate across these dimensions. The big takeaway from this chart is that less than half of the study's participants rate their branding guidelines as good or very good where effectiveness is concerned. When it comes to branding guidelines effectiveness, the problem isn't that the guidelines aren't current or that they're hard to comply with. The issue is simply that too often they're just hard to find. The best set of branding guidelines ever developed are of no use if they're difficult or impossible to find. When looking more closely at this data, 
For those participants who rated their branding guidelines effectiveness as very poor to poor, just 9% said their branding guidelines were easy to find. Let me repeat that because that just staggered my mind. The participants who rated their branding guidelines effectiveness as very poor to poor, just 9% said they were easy to find. I, I think that's the root of the problem. As this study has shown, having formal guidelines that are consistently enforced, that's important. But if they're difficult to find, they're robbed of their power to drive brand presentation consistency. The format in which branding guidelines are kept does have something to do with how easy they are to find, share, and use. And so this chart shows the results of our survey's question about the format in which branding guidelines are maintained. Uh, what I'm showing you here is the branding guidelines format data in two segments, those who say their guidelines are effective and those who say they are not. And so I'm referring, of course, to the effectiveness bar on the bottom of the last chart I just showed you. Study participants with effective branding guidelines rely most heavily on PDF versions of their guidelines. Pretty uh, substantial margin, as you see from the top set of bars. It certainly seems that the effectiveness of branding guidelines has something to do with the format in which the guidelines are published. And in this study, the participants with the most effective branding guidelines favored the PDF format for making their guidelines available. But even those using a PDF format fall short of consistent enforcement. So Luke, I want to ask you to come back in and share some thoughts with us on this. Yeah, I think this is great. I think I think this helps emphasize the power of the right tools uh, to help an organization uh, do exactly what you're describing. Take their guidelines and make sure they're present in places where people work. Um, and, and you see that uh, you know those those uh, who are effective are, are, are using PDFs and, and all of these different things. Um, the other thing that I, I'd cause everyone to reflect uh, that was a little interesting to me was how little the other format was here. Uh, I, I don't know where, you know, those listening, where you work, where, where do you fit? What does your organization use? Do you use PDFs, oral tradition, printed web pages, a SharePoint or other other site uh, to be able to, to log and, and distribute your, your brand guidelines and, and enforcement guidelines? Um, None of these seem like solutions that worked really well for me. Even if you had a PDF document, the question is, where does that live? Well, probably in your email inbox, buried with thousands of other messages that you probably didn't read. Maybe you did. Maybe you saved it. Um, I think I think the world's ripe for better solutions uh, to be able to make sure that effectiveness uh, is 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 out there. And in addition to just the format piece. There's another component of this whole guidelines uh, dimension that I want to share with you. So let's move to this slide and look at uh, a little analysis we did on the format data because it revealed a relationship between the enforcement of branding guidelines and the variety of formats in which the guidelines are made available. And that's what this table is showing. Uh, it seems that the more serious a firm is about enforcing branding guidelines, it provides those guidelines in more formats. So what I'm showing you in the row of the table is the average number of branding guideline formats. And uh, the overall survey uh, sample was 1.8. That's the average number of formats the guidelines are offered in. If you have formal guidelines that are not enforced, it's 1.6 is the average. If the guidelines are selectively enforced, 1.9. But then we see the big jump. When guidelines are consistently enforced, the guidelines are offered in an average of 2.4 different formats. So offering branding guidelines in many formats also makes them easier to find. And that characteristic, being easy to find, is strongly related to the effectiveness of branding guidelines. So there's one easy thing to do, is offer them in many formats. More than the other factor, I'm convinced that the perception of how much time it takes marketing to respond to requests for new or customized branded materials accounts for the creation of more rogue materials than any other factor. The frustration of waiting drives many to decide it's easier to get forgiveness than permission. Uh, 
So they forge ahead and create their own material that may or may not comply with brand standards. This concern feeds a common belief that the price an organization has to pay to maintain brand consistency is slow response times to requests for material. It's a simple, logical assumption to make. The desire to maintain brand consistency must necessarily slow the branded materials production process down. Uh, as an audit or some sort of inspection step must occur before the branded materials are released for use. That's a logical assumption, but is it true? To investigate this, we had our study participants tell us how long it typically takes corporate marketing or design to fulfill requests for new or customized branded material. And you see the results in this chart here. It you know, varies from... Um, uh, you know, near the bottom, requests aren't accommodated at all. That's just 3%, uh, and it ranges from really less than a day to a month or more. To really find out if an organization's desire to maintain brand consistency slows down the response time to field requests for materials, we looked at this data using the brand consistency segments we've already used several times in sharing these results with you. So let's see what those differences are. What we found is that for organizations with a consistent brand presentation, that's the column on the right-hand side, 40% report that it takes them less than a week, and that is the sum of the bolded, italicized percentages in the rightmost column. And I've, I've drawn a box around those as well, by the way. Uh, it takes less than a week to fulfill requests for newer customized materials. Compare this to organizations with an inconsistent brand presentation, and that's the column in the middle. Just 24% respond to such requests in less than a week. This finding refutes the notion that organizations that maintain good brand consistency are less responsive when requests for materials come in from the field. It is possible to enforce brand standards and still be responsive to field requests for new or customized material. In fact, it even seems to improve responsiveness, probably because the guidelines eliminate confusion and empower the creation of compliant materials. All marketers and brand managers understand that presenting a brand inconsistently has some negative impact, and this study survey attempted to catalog those negative impacts, and so you see the results in this chart. Creating market confusion is the most prevalent impact of inconsistent brand usage, and that is felt by 71%. Uh, that's the top bar in our chart. Uh, so of the negative impacts that result from inconsistent usage, creating confusions, at the top of the list, a brand is the path for connecting with customers. It ideally expresses values and implies promises that resonate with customers. Using brands inconsistently interferes with their ability to convey the messages associated with the brand, and that creates confusion. Brands strive for recognition. That's what we want from our brands, recognition. But inconsistent usage has the opposite result. It creates confusion. The impacts of inconsistent brand usage that I just shared, they're not just theoretical. They have a real cost. Understanding this cost begins with knowing how often marketing, communication, or sales materials are created that don't conform to brand consistency guidelines. So as we see in this chart, 90% of study participants experience some level of inconsistent branding in the materials they create. We asked a follow-on question of the study participants that indicated they always, often, or sometimes have material created and deployed that doesn't comply to standards. So always, often, or sometimes, the three leftmost bars in this chart. We asked them a follow-on question. So let's take a look at the question. For the always, often, and sometimes, uh, if there's a cost to developing and enforcing branding guidelines, there's clearly a significant revenue benefit that more than offsets these costs. Here's the question we asked. If your brand was always presented consistently, how much do you estimate that your revenue would increase? The average answer, 23%. And the answers ranged, by the way, from 5 to 50%. 
What CEO, CFO, or any executive would not consider any opportunity to generate a 23% increase in revenue? Those organizations that haven't managed their brands well are hobbling their revenue potential through inconsistent presentation of the brand and not by just a little. Right, so we also asked a question of those who said they rarely or never see materials created and deployed that are inconsistent with the brand. And so here's the question we asked them. How do you feel that the brand consistency you've maintained has contributed to your growth? And the responses are in the chart right below the question on the screen. The study participants that indicated they rarely or never see material created or deployed that violates guidelines were asked the question, and here are the results. Um, and, and the answer in chart form, over half of study participants indicate substantial or very substantial growth comes from maintaining brand consistency. This chart shares what I think is the most important finding from this study. Organizations that make an effort to maintain brand consistency get a growth dividend from doing so. Almost 85% of those firms in this category attribute 10% or more growth to their efforts, and one in five are realizing 20% or greater growth from their efforts to maintain brand consistency. Those are pretty significant numbers. Okay, so, so much for the data. I know you've endured lots of charts and graphs, so hopefully some of it has sunk in. Let's talk about some actions and next steps. For many organizations, their brand is their most valuable asset. And for every organization, the brand holds the promise of becoming its most valuable asset through proper management. Almost every study participant agrees that it's important to consistently present the brand in all the places it's encountered. Highly visible brands are like magnets. They attract customers to them while conveying brand promises and reinforcing the brand value and encouraging loyalty. Careless or inconsistent presentation of a brand robs it of some of these coveted powers. So while almost all of the study's participants agree that consistent presentation is important, less than half of them are protecting their brand. What recommendations do we have for you? Well, let's go through some. The first one is simply manage your brand. And when I use the word management here, I'm referring to the verb form because it's an action that you take. Who has responsibility for managing the brand has a lot to do with achieving brand consistency. As we've shared with you, primary responsibility should fall to the CMO or another marketing executive. But if marketing is driving the brand management bus, then the CEO is navigating, telling marketing where the brand needs to go. A CEO who cares about brand consistency and then empowers the CMO to manage the brand creates the ideal conditions for a brand to grow and remain strong. The second recommendation that I have for you is branding guidelines. Uh, number one, have them <laughs> and then make them current uh, easy to comply with and certainly easy to find. The secret to controlling non-conforming uses of the brand isn't to restrict who creates or modifies materials. Instead, it's to have a set of guidelines that are current, easy to comply with, and findable. The single most important attribute of effective branding guidelines is that they're easy to find. And this means making them available in multiple formats through multiple channels. And when these conditions exist, the guidelines also empower proper use of the brand. Now, I don't want to sound too harsh, but enforcement is pretty important, too. The existence of branding guidelines is critical to attaining a high degree of consistency, but alone, they're not enough. Enforcement of those guidelines is what creates the advantage. In this study, enforcement levels range from none to consistent enforcement, which is the level necessary to ensure brand standards are maintained. Yet just one-fourth of our study's participants enforce their branding guidelines at this level. So there's a lot of organizations have a long way to go. The last one I want to share with you, responsiveness. When marketing takes on the mantle of brand protector and enforcer of guidelines, it must also remain sensitive to requests for new or customized branded materials. 
The natural expectation is that with the introduction of guidelines and enforcement comes bureaucracy and red tape. Guidelines, in reality, however, they actually streamline the process of creating new or customized materials because the creative boundaries are set and fear and doubt is removed. Marketing can and should respond faster than if guidelines did not exist. So those are kind of my takeaways. Um, what I want to do is pause once again and just say we want your questions. We're really close to getting to them. So please enter your questions and comments. And, and let me turn it back over to Luke to kind of close this part of our discussion out. Hey, really appreciate that. You know, I, I think this, the recommendations you shared, Jerry, are, are, are just great. And, and I hope that those listening uh, agree with them. I, I think they do. Res they resonate with me. And I think they'll resonate with many. What I just wanted to offer here at the end were a couple of ideas of tools to go do that. You know, Lucid Press believes a lot in this kind of research, this idea, and 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 we saw in the study that uh, how important it is to make the guidelines. Uh, omnipresent in your organization so that when those who work for you to get their jobs done need to create something, they know the brand guidelines, they can find them, and they can use them. Uh, and one thing that we're offering, you know, Lucid Press is a web-based online tool uh, for the creation of content. We actually have a template that contains an example of a brand guidelines document. Uh, that uh, that we'll be sharing uh, with everyone who's here listening on the webinar and make available on our website and resources page afterward. Uh, so if you don't have a clear, easy to follow document that contains your brand guidelines, the fonts, the styles, the colors, uh, logos, uh, et cetera, uh, we've got something for you that can help you just that much more quickly get to that point. Um, and uh, anyone listening to this call also uh, will we'll let you use lucidpress.com for free. If you need a tool to, to edit that, to download it as a PDF, or even also to publish it online, um, that's something that we'll make available uh, to those uh, who, who get some of the follow-up, or, or even go to lucidpress.com and you can, you can research what we can do. Um, I just emphasize that it is so important to have tools. Uh, you know, what we learned today was that for those firms that do this well, it starts at the top. So often the CEO or CMO was driving it, which presents the challenge of how you do that. And, and even the responsiveness uh, data that you showed that showed that actually, Jerry, as you pointed out, those firms that enforce it and that are more consistent, they also respond faster. Uh, I think some of that is because their guidelines are easy to follow. I think some of it is because they're dedicating resources to it. And so for those who may be looking at Envy at some of this data and thinking, well, how can I do that? I, I don't have the resources, the time of my leadership. I don't have the resources to have a, a big design team of folks that can be responsive. Uh, look for tools that help. Even some of the tools you're using today probably have features that you're not using. In Microsoft Word, there is a way actually to develop some style restrictions, a little clunky to use. Uh, we at Lucid Press are biased. We have a platform that's been tailor-made to do this. Uh, in Lucid Press, when you go to select a font or to select a, a color, uh, we allow brand owners to set up the account to put guardrails up so that they can indicate these are our brand fonts, these are our brand colors. And to us, that's the ultimate marriage. If you can find a tool that puts your guidelines into the tool itself to guide people to create things in the right way, uh, you're just going to make it that much easier uh, to, to facilitate people to produce what you, what, what, what you want them to, which is to represent your brand well, to reinforce the consistency, and get all the benefits that you get from a brand, which, which uh, are associations that you build up over time and, and, and that pay off in the minds of, of consumers and customers that associate the good feelings they have from, from your material with you. So uh, hopefully those are a few tips. Uh, again, Lucid Press, you can tweet at us at Lucid Press. Uh, tweet at me, uh, go to our resource page, uh, or just look to the follow-up after this webinar. We'll, we'll, via email, be sharing some of those templates and more information about how you can, for free, use some of the tools that we'll be putting, making available to, uh, to, to get better at this, if that's something that's helpful. All right. Well, Luke, thanks, and I completely agree. You know, uh, combining the guidelines with the tool that you uh, allow your users to create materials with is the ideal way to make sure it all happens well and smoothly and in com compliance. So that's the right approach. So let's do this. We're going to look now at your questions. So 
uh, give us a second or two to get over there to the questions and go through them, and uh, we'll answer as many as we can while we have time. So we will go to your questions right now. Okay, and questions, you guys did great coming through with questions for us, so let's go through those, and let me just warn you, uh, we're going to try and get through all of them, and we probably will go past the top of the hour, so if you have to leave us, we understand it's not going to hurt my feelings or Luke's, um, so let's just jump right into them. First question we have here is about social media, and it is, do you feel social media has contributed to more issues and problems with brand development? Or has it acted as a catalyst for innovation? Uh, I know Luke has a resource he's going to share with you. But let me make one comment. And if you look at the uses of social media, which is actually uh, a study I've done in the last year as well, brand awareness is one of the top uses for social media. So it's certainly powerful for that. Uh, so I think overall it's a function of how you use it. You, you can manage it well and benefit the brand or mismanage it and potentially hurt the brand. Uh, Luke, why don't you talk to us about what you all have to offer here? Yeah, no, I mean, I think uh, – so, so a couple things. One, we're, we're going to send out here a link uh, to an ebook we've put together as we've done some research about how to adapt brand to social media. A couple of principles that I think are important. Uh, I do think social media – is both a good thing and a challenging thing. It presents a lot of new opportunity and new ways and places to connect with consumers, uh, but it makes it challenging to keep that consistent. Uh, and not only keep your brand consistent, but the key with social media is to understand the tone and the sort of rules and culture of the channel. Tumblr is different than Facebook, is different than LinkedIn, is different than Snapchat. And uh, some of those avenues are more appropriate for different brands uh, Coca-Cola, uh, unsurprisingly, given their focus on branding, actually is one that does a great job of, uh, of injecting maybe some different humor that's still true to their brand but, but fits Tumblr uh, and kind of some of the quirky sensibilities there. Uh, so I, I, think, I think social media is inevitably something that everyone uh, managing their brand needs to confront, and it's better to try to embrace it and get ahead of it and recognize that it needs to be, it, it, it is a tool, uh, and, uh, and work with folks to be able to, to, to manage it consistently. Uh, so those are some of the principles, and again, we're actually tweeting out now the link, and, and I've shared it with Jerry and John at Demand Metric to, to be able to push out. Uh, so that's something you can see to get an ebook. But the final thing I'd say, is that, is that equipping your team with a tool to use social media well, and there's a variety of tools out there. There are tools for publishing the hoot suites of the world, and there's a whole variety of others that make it easy. Uh, but, uh, you know, tools that help uh, people in your organizations use social media uh, graphically as well. So Lucid Press, uh, again, is a tool where we have built social media templates. So if you need a a Facebook image or various other things. Um, you want to equip your team with tools where they can quickly make graphics uh, and other things to participate in those channels. So uh, th those are some thoughts uh, on social media. Yeah, so let me just push to the audience real quick. Um, they tweeted out the link to that ebook, and so there is the Lucid Press Twitter handle. You can go out there and look for that. Let me also add that you know since we don't have the ability to interact directly with you, we may not answer a question the way you thought we would. So if you want to uh, dialogue with me further, I welcome the dialogue. Uh, you can, my email address is simply jerry at demandmetric.com. Love to hear from you after this is over if you want to follow up or ask another question or even challenge something we've said. So feel free to reach out. Question number two. We are trying to enter the U.S. market, and our company name and logo imply that we operate only in Europe. 
So we are discussing whether just using acronyms would harm or further the visibility of our brand outside of Europe. What are your thoughts? That's a really uh, tough question. I understand the importance behind it. So here's what I can tell you is, number one, don't assume that your brand that implies you are regional uh, is a liability. Uh, let's take a look at one of the most famous examples I can think of, Southwest Airlines. And can you fly to the northeast part of the United States on Southwest Airlines? The answer is yes, you can. So their, their brand would imply something that's not true, and their audience and customers said, oh, understand that about them. Um, but, but when you're new and you don't have the brand awareness, the consideration might be a little bit different. You know, the best thing to do, honestly, is you, you've got to do a little bit of research. If you understand who you're trying to reach in your target market, is to, and it can be informal, but go to them and say, this is who we are, this is our brand. Based on what you know, would you consider doing business with us or you know, accept a proposal from us or what's your, your general reaction? That's really the right way to go about this. But as I said, don't assume it's a liability. Luke, I want to let you add something if you had something here to share as well. I think you're right. The other thing I would just encourage, because uh, there's no objectively right answer in these circumstances, Think about the future and work backwards. Imagine success, uh, whereas you come into a market outside of Europe and, and you, or you're successful. Um, are you going to want to have two different names, two different logos? Or would you prefer to have one? Um, try to act today in the best way that you can to be successful and also not, not box yourself into a corner in the future. So that would be the encouragement, uh, but, but obviously... It, that's a tough, it's a tough challenge, and, and every situation there is a little bit different depending on the business. Certainly. Uh, question three, and in the age of the Internet, where old logos of your company may be floating around, <laughs> in other words, they live forever online, how do you effectively release a new logo while also erasing the existence of your old logo? Uh, challenging for sure, but there's ways you can deal with this. So here's a couple of ideas. When it comes to the old stuff that's floating around on the Internet, you really want to look at it the same way you would do reputation management online. And that is, if there's bad stuff out there, you put enough good new stuff out there to push the bad stuff down on the search engine results list or page. So that's certainly one way to handle it. But another way I think that some companies have decided to do is just confront it head on, and that is to make your current set of logos available on your website, maybe under the About Us section or someplace where they're relatively easy to find, and just be really upfront and say, here they are, and, and also here are our guidelines for using our logos. And you know, put the right uh, keywords around the logo so that when someone does an online search, chances are your own logo page may be the first thing that comes up. So those are just two thoughts, things to consider. It is difficult to make them completely go away. You just sometimes can't. But uh, Luke, you may have some ideas also if you want to share something. Yeah, I mean, tactically, if there's an external site that has a logo of yours that's old, nuts and bolts, reach out to them. You know, find out who wrote that blog post. Find out who's hosting that site. Let them know. Send them an updated logo. Google will recrawl it. It helps with the problem. Um, the other constituency you need to remind yourself of, though, is your internal employees uh, who need access to your logo and other materials to do their job. And so certainly when there, ever there's a rebrand, and I see there's a couple of other questions about rebranding that we'll, we'll get to here shortly, um, important to have a plan to release that, a communication plan, and to make it dead simple for anyone creating content in your company to be able to access and find that logo. Uh, there are a lot of digital asset management tools out there that can help do that. Uh, there are ways to create, even, I mean, if you're, whatever your company is using, Dropbox, Box, Google, Google Drive, there's lots of cloud solutions. Just create a folder uh, if that's what you want to do. You know, Lucid Press happens to be a tool that helps make this easy too because we built that functionality into the tool that people use to create documents uh, with brand assets and shared and, and, and that sort of collateral that just puts it as close as you can to the hands and mouse of the people who are actually making uh, content for your company. Uh, so that, that would be another way to address the internal constituencies as opposed to just the, uh, the outside ones. Yeah, great ideas. Uh, our fourth question, how can a small business practice and enforce 
brand consistency. So I think some of the principles are the same regardless of the size of company that exists. But but my feelings are I think it's easiest to practice and enforce in a smaller company because there's typically more proximity of employees to each other, uh, more close working relationships, and easier communication paths throughout the company when that's small versus when it's a large distributed you know company. Uh, so I, I think number one is, as we discussed earlier in our presentation, is you have to first have guidelines before you can enforce them. And that's really where it starts, is by having guidelines, making them easy to find. But also don't just, uh, no one likes having rules just imposed upon them without understanding why they're important. I think what you always do is communicate, this is why we have guidelines and this is why we enforce them. Because the brand is an asset. Uh, and and the ideal yep. is for that brand to become the most valuable asset a company has, and that's where you want to take the brand. Some companies are there already. So, uh, Luke, uh, again, if you have some things you want to share, I'd like to you have that chance. Yeah, it, it, it's it's much of what we've covered today in the webinar. You've got to have clear guidelines and make them accessible. Uh, in the resource tab up at the top left, you, you should still be able to see a link to a template that, that we at Lucid Press have published that contains an example uh, of brand guidelines that, that covers all of the elements. It's not just necessarily logo and typography. There's also tone and voice and, and those sorts of things. We've got that there. I think if you're running a small business, you need to find time to, to put that together, have a discussion with people on your team. Uh, I think the content of this presentation has nuggets to help enforce the why. Right? There, was a consi there was a correlation between those companies that were more consistent in how they treated their brand and their brand's visibility. Uh, when we asked and surveyed how much revenue would improve if your brand was more visible and consistent, uh, you, you see the numbers. Right? It's, it's double-digit percentage points. People think that they would have that improvement. So I think using those things here to convey the why and the how, give people a brand, uh, a brand style guide, um, and adopt tools that let them easily use that. Uh, I speak a lot about Lucid Press. Again, we sponsored the research because we believe in this, and our own product does it. We make a platform available uh, where, where people can create content, but enterprises and small businesses can dictate what fonts are available, what colors are available, where your what what images are there, to really just make sure that the guardrails are on uh, for folks uh, that are creating content in your small business to make sure that they, they do it the right way. So, uh, so, so we obviously recommend our own platform, uh, LucidPress.com. Anyone can go sign up. You can try it for free. Uh, we have a freemium business model, um, and so that may be one way to do it. But even after that, please get guidelines if you don't have them. Share them with your organization, whether it's just a PDF in their inbox, at least then they have them. So if they don't have them, they can't even begin to follow them. And I think we really may have answered the next question as well about what are the core type of branding, of, I'm sorry, of guidelines found in a branding guideline, and how do they differ for a big company from a small company? I want to point you back to the resource that Luke just mentioned. They have a resource available to help you develop a branding guideline, a template that he mentioned. And you should go out there and get that. And the other thing I think I'm going to weigh in on my opinion, I don't know that branding guidelines really differ from big companies to small companies. Typically, uh, branding guidelines talk about acceptable usage and how the brand is presented and rendered. And so you just try to remove the variability uh, with a brand that can create that confusion. So uh, I think that's probably the answer to that question. And uh, Luke, I think I'm right that you have provided that as a resource in the tab, the branding guidelines right. template? Yeah, we, we certainly have. So it's there. If for some reason anyone's watching the webinar and can't see it, um, uh, just follow follow me on Twitter. Uh, Luke Langford's my handle, uh, or Lucid Press on Twitter. We're going to tweet that again back out um, so folks can find it. Uh, we'll be following up after the, the webinar, of course, with email for folks. But, but again, it's there in the resource tab. So uh, you know, unless that's not working for you, you should just be able to click there. It's called the Brand Style Guide Template, um, and uh, you can download that as a PDF. Or if you'd like to edit it, click right in. It's a document in Lucid Press, and you can 
you can sign up and then adjust it, adapt it as you need to. So uh, that, that's probably the best resource that I would point people toward. Our next question, what's an example of a brand that always generates content consistent with the brand? Uh, you know, these are big brands that we are familiar with, so, but you don't have to be a big brand to do a good job of this. Uh, the one that comes to mind for me is Nike. And so look at how ubiquitous the swoosh stripe is as a visual element of the Nike brand. But then look at the content. And I would submit to you that if you look at uh, the marketing content that Nike produces and you erased the iconic brand component from that content, most of us would still be able to guess that Nike did that. That's a, that looks like a Nike ad, for example. I think Nike does a great job. I'll also point you to our friends over at HubSpot. Uh, they have a blog post from March of 2013, 15 Businesses to Admire for Consistent Stellar Branding. And so if you want to see some brands that maybe you're not quite as familiar with that are doing a great job, go look up the blog posts from HubSpot on Consistent Stellar Branding and, and get a feel from that. Um, so that's just my two cents on that. Luke, if you have something to add, please do. Uh, I reference again just Coca-Cola as a brand that we've studied that does a fantastic job keeping things consistent but adapting it to the venue and channel where they're in. If you look for them across social media versus in the real world or their own website, TV ads, um, you can not only see the thread of how it's connected but also see how they adapt it, uh, which is also instructive uh, because brands do need to have some adaptation based on the channel and the audience you're reaching. I think they do a great job of that. Yeah, agreed. Uh, our next question, Luke, I think I'm going to pitch this one to you first, and uh, I'll, I'll say some things as well, perhaps after you're done, but how can a CEO or CMO practically communicate a vision for their brand to employees? Great question. Um, step, step zero is to actually have that vision uh, as part of the strategy of the business, and that's a whole other webinar and conversation, but, but if, if I assume you have that, um, I, I think there's, there's no better way than, than to just repeat it. Uh, repetition is important to let it sink in. Repetition is important to make sure your, your team and employees know how important it is. And so I, I don't think there's a magic bullet beyond taking the time to bring it up in company all-hands meetings. If you're a distributed company and can't do it, Whenever the CEO, CMO does visits, pull people together, talk about how it's important in, in the mix of the other things that are important to talk about. Um, and, then, and then make visible your efforts to promote its good use, uh, recognize people for getting the right tone and voice when they share. Um, I'm not suggesting you necessarily make a bad example, but, but put, put systems and tools into place to encourage people to do it right and, uh, and smack a couple folks who don't and correct and, and, and provide, provide a better way. Uh, so I, I, don't ha I know that I have a, a secret magic bullet except to say you've got to communicate it, you've got to repeat it. Um, you know, we've worked with a variety of clients in the healthcare space uh, as an example, and those we see that are hospital groups that are large that do this incredibly well, it's, it's, it's throughout their culture. A new employee hired, uh, to one particular hospital chain, I won't mention their name, but because I haven't asked the permission to, but but uh, you know they've got hundreds of hospitals. Anyone they hired as part of their new employee orientation uh, has a few minute conversation about their brand, how to use it, what it means, why they've chosen the colors, wh why they've chosen their logo, uh, why they've chosen their name, and and so right from the beginning they try to bring people on with an appreciation. And, uh, and so that's the sort of goal I think you should strive for. It doesn't happen overnight, but, uh, but you need to make it not a separate topic that occasionally is talked about. Weave it into everything from onboarding uh, and throughout everything you emphasize uh, as a senior leader with your company. Repetition is key. You've got to keep talking about it, talk about it all the time. And you've got to remember that you can't untether the brand from the values that it stands for. And so, as I said in our presentation today, a brand is really a trust mark. And so, you don't tarnish it through inconsistent usage. And I think the message that comes out of the executive's mouth on that on a regular basis will have an impact. Uh, next question we've got here. 
very it's really kind of similar. How do I convince my CEO that brand consistency is vital to the albeit moderately small company? Well, one thing I would do is get a copy of the report from the study and show the data that we shared at the end. In fact, let me go put it back up because I think I can just get to that slide right now. Right here, this is the question we asked when you don't consistently you know, present your brand, that you, you have uh, problems. What would, what would do, happen to your revenue if you could fix that? An average 23% increase. I think sharing this kind of data has a big impact on executives because it takes this issue of brand management out of the ethereal, out of the space of being something touchy-feely into the space of something very concrete. And, and touching on a metric that matters a lot to the CEO, there's a real value associated with it. Uh, Luke, is there something you'd like to add here as well? No, I, I, I think you can made it well. Okay. I, I, think this webinar, so, I think this webinar is valuable, and I think it, it, it hopefully has some of the ammo to help, help convince a potentially skeptical leader uh, that it is important, uh, even in a small business, to, uh, to make consistency. Because, again, we didn't go survey huge companies. I mean, if you go to the beginning, and if, if Jerry talks about the, the slices of revenue of the companies that we surveyed, uh, many of them are under $10 million. Now, we certainly have larger companies in our sample, uh, but uh, these are not all big businesses. Uh, we're not talking about, in this study, the Coca-Colas of the world exclusively. We're talking about a, lot, a wide variety of businesses that do find this to be important and find that consistency does relate to how important their leadership takes it and, and, and how much revenue they earn. Very good point. Uh, question, let's see, question nine. I can see how this information can relate to nonprofit. Is there anything that may be different or any other information that a nonprofit would need for branding? In my opinion, the short answer is no. I think the principles are the same, whether you're a nonprofit or a for-profit entity. Uh, Luke, what do you think? I think you hit the nail on the head, Jerry. Uh, too often, I think nonprofit leaders may view too much brand consistency or too much polish as something that is for a for-profit organization, and sometimes they, they, they want to stand apart from that. I think they do themselves a disservice. I think that uh, uh, get your brand right for the type of business you are, the type of nonprofit you are, uh, but the consistency matters. It's how you reinforce the associations you want. It's how you it's how you develop the image you want. It's how, it's how often you get things done in communities uh, is, is with the brand and the associations that, uh, that come with that. So uh, I, think, I think first just the step is treat it as though almost you were for profit in the sense that you take it seriously and recognize that, that good brand consistency and visibility is important to your nonprofit's mission and objective. Okay, we still have a few questions left, so thanks for hanging in there, those of you who didn't have to disconnect. Uh, this is a great example of what we've been talking about. Someone in my firm uses different fonts than are in our guidelines. What are your thoughts on the impact of this? <laughs> Luke, you want to go first here? Yeah, I mean, first it depends whether it's internal or external uh, to some extent the consequence, but I'd say both have negative consequences. Uh, internal documents, when folks notice it, uh, and it, it becomes worst case an annoyance where people are doing rework of documents to make sure fonts are consistent, or it just, it just leads to less professional a tone and tenor in the office. Uh, if you're working through a PowerPoint document that many people have all put together, and one, some slides have one font, some have the other, um, it, it can give the air that, that errors are okay, or that the brand, and, and just being professional and exact is not important. And then, and then similar things externally, uh, customers oftentimes consciously, oftentimes unconsciously will notice these things, and it just, it just deprives your brand of that ability to concentrate the associations you want with it in the minds of your customers. Um, so it may seem subtle. I don't think it is. I, I think it's something that uh, you should have a chat with that person and show them what the guidelines are, explain to them the value of brand and how brands are built through consistent repetition and that uh, every experience someone has with a brand, they associate, you know, hopefully good things with that brand, and, and, uh, and you want to concentrate that. And, and by using different logos, different fonts, different tone of voice, uh, you're just diluting the concentration of that effect, which, which is harmful. That's exactly what you're doing. You're diluting it. I'll give you a metaphor here. So the Ritz-Carlton, one of the classiest 
most upscale hotel chains in the world. If you checked into a Ritz Carlton as a guest and you went into the bathroom and there was a dirty towel on the floor, that's a violation of the Ritz Carlton brand. I think, in my opinion, this may sound strong, but I think when you you know use a different font or maybe slightly change the color in a logo or something like that, some type of difference, it's no different. You are you are you know violating the brand, and when you do it, especially internally, what it does is it tacitly gives everyone else permission to go, oh, well, I guess we can take those liberties, you know, the way we present the brand. And the answer is no, you don't want that. So that's my opinion on that one. <laughs> I think we're in lockstep on that, Luke. Um, we are. Let's see. What, which is the most important thing to take into account to make a mark? Uh, and I presume that means to make a mark with the brand. Uh, well, of course, I, I'm going to give you a quick answer. I think it's consistency and repetition. I think consistency and repetition are kind of the two big things. Um, Luke, what do you think? You're exactly right. Uh, I mean, depending on the space, and you know, and, I, and I'm no expert on coming up with the creative, uh, so my expertise is not telling you how to really develop that, that memorable uh, brand idea and concept. But, uh, but certainly no brand maintains memorability if it's not portrayed consistently and repeated often. Uh, any, any brand that's iconic, those we've mentioned here, the Nikes, the Apples, the Coca-Colas, you see the repetition and, uh, and, and, and it's presented consistently. And, uh, and that's that's critical to reinforcing and concentrating the effect uh, of their brands. Yeah, for sure. Okay, okay. Um, let's see. Great questions, all of them. Here's another great one. We're undergoing a complete rebranding. What best practices do you suggest for the initial launch communications internally and externally? I, I want to encourage you to not shortchange the internal piece of this. So your communications to the own, your own team, you need to describe why. What motivated the change? Where did the change come from? And what do you expect the change to do for the company? How will the rebranding serve as a launch pad? So I think that's really important. Don't assume everyone gets it. The second thing I recommend you do is to help really instill you know, the key messages around the rebranding is go to some of the key influential employees, especially non-management employees, and get them on board with you early and say, here's what we're doing, and, and get them to become champions of the rebranding so out in the ranks they are ambassadors for what's being done because that's who everyone's going to look to anyway to say – is this a good idea? Or do we just waste a bunch of money? Is this just some crazy marketing, you know, goose that's being chased? Uh, so uh, those are just a couple of practical things. And treat your employee uh, rollout, your internal rollout, with the same care and planning that you would with the customers, because I think if you do that, you're going to find the customer external rollout is going to be uh, much more impactful. Uh, Luke, any thoughts you want to share on that? So. So we have a lot of thoughts at this. So one, one of the – we work with a lot of clients who adopt Lucid Press as a platform to do it. Now, Lucid Press is not the only way to go about this, but when we work with clients who are through a rebrand, uh, tremendous amounts of money, even for small businesses, can be spent. I was talking with one nonprofit um, in Ohio, a small clinic that serves the Cleveland city area, have a few locations. They got a grant and are spending tens of thousands of dollars, a tremendous amount of what would be their marketing budget if they hadn't gotten a grant to go do a rebrand because they wanted to improve their visibility and standing in the community to further their mission. And and what was so important to them was was to make it stick. So much effort and investment was going into this. And, And so you have to have a plan not just to launch it, but to see it through. And and Lucid Press, uh, again, we built a tool to help do that, get everyone on the platform uh, with Lucid Press or, or whatever you're doing. Again, uh, certainly there are other ways to do this. We believe they take a little more work, but if you're using Lucid Press as an example, um, get people to, to into the product. Uh, you can use a tool like ours to indicate what are the fonts, what are the colors, 
upload all of your brand assets and logos. So they're just a finger, they're fingertips when they know to create things. You can upload templates with Lucid Press and lock them down uh, to provide enough freedom for people to get their jobs done, but not so much freedom they can go mess things up. And if you can go convert the documents they need and provide them with templates and put the guardrails on, um, when you communicate the rebrand and launch things, uh, People want, want to comply, and now it's super easy for them to do so, and so they can continue to get their jobs done while also doing well by your brand. Um, so, so again, we, we recommend Lucid Press as a platform. Uh, one of the top reasons people adopt us is because they're going through that rebranding moment and want to make sure that they don't look back months or years after and, uh, and regret how they didn't get all their collaterals switched over or they were still given out at trade shows, collateral with the different different logos or different fonts, and they just you know they they lost some of the momentum they had, and, and we can help with that. Um, if, if Lucid Press is not the tool for you, take those same principles though. You've got to communicate what you need. You've got to make it very easy to know where are the new guidelines. You've got to try to take away the old ways of doing things too, uh, so that you can really encourage people to do it. But the core principle here is, if you want people to comply, you've got to make it easy. Uh, even your best employees uh, don't want to go out of their way to help your brand stay consistent. They want to get their jobs done. And so you've got to just recognize that about human nature and make it as easy as possible for them to do that. Okay, we're uh, getting close to the end of our questions, but we appreciate all of your questions. They're so insightful. Uh, a question here that we have is, which um, is it that... Let me make sure I'm reading the right question, which most affects the growth of a brand. And let me just share what I think, everything we've talked about in terms of consistency of presentation and enforcement. Yeah, yeah, that stuff's really important. But I'll tell you what I think is underneath that is even maybe more important is the values. How consistently the brand uh, and every action associated with the brand expresses the values that are attached to that brand. You can't have inconsistency there. That's what does the most damage to you, is if you are busy from a marketing perspective saying things, you know, this is what we stand for and this is what we do and this is who we are as a brand, and then your actions are inconsistent. The values have to be aligned with the brand promise. Absolutely, to me, that's most important. Um, Luke, comments on that? Not much more to add. I think you covered some good points, and uh, and it's hard to be more specific without knowing a lot more detail of exactly what kind of brand and what's their space in industry. Is it a consumer brand? Is it a business brand? Um, but but I, th I think you had some good points that are that are generalizable. Thank you. Uh, so here's a statement. I, I have lots of sympathy for this. We had great branding and industry recognition. Then we were purchased by another company who got rid of the logo and impression was we were out of business. We are now being restructured with new similar product, debate, use of elements, original brand, or, um, or something else, I guess. Uh, wow, that's, that's tough. I've, I'm aware of situations where there's been an acquisition and someone who had great branding ends up losing. Uh, there's a winner and a loser, and what happens to the brand equity? And, boy, I'm really reluctant from a brand perspective to just chunk all the brand equity out the window uh, and slap the new brand, uh, especially if the new brand doesn't have the same kind of charisma attached to it that the uh, acquired brand did. I don't know what to say other than I have sympathy for this uh, person who, who uh, echoed this. And I would suggest if, you, if there's an still opportunity – Proceed with a lot of caution, get the egos out of the equation, and do the research to figure out which brand is going to really serve the, the, the new entity best. You got any advice on that one, Luke? Yeah. You know, I think uh, it does depend on have you moved too far down the road with a new brand to where you need to kind of keep with the new because if you switch again, have you lost the, the new momentum that you've got with, uh, with the brand of the acquire the new product name? What I will say is, if there's, but, but having said that, if, if, if you don't feel there is a lot of new momentum uh, with the brand you've been working on post-acquisition and you look back longingly at the industry recognition and the brand equity that was built up with the old brand, absolutely consider doing it. There are some famous examples 
uh, of companies that have done this. Uh, I mean, frankly, AT&T today uh, is not the AT&T of long ago. That was split up. Most of what you see today uh, was one of the baby bells uh, from the southeast. Uh, buys singular wireless and rebrands the whole thing as AT&T uh, because that brand has just had, had been around for so long and was known by so many. So going back to them was useful both in the business and the consumer space. DeWalt uh, as a brand uh, of power tools uh, didn't exist for decades in the middle of last century. Uh, Black & Decker wants to get into the space, do a better job with profession, the professional market or prosumer and, and resurrects it uh, to enormous success. So uh, brands can fade but still maintain a lot of the equity and sometimes going backwards uh, can, can be a step forward in that regard. Uh, but, but hard to know more without the specifics of the current of the situation that uh, that, that question uh, question that comes from. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's tricky and no two uh, situations are the same. All right. I think we just have time for one more, uh, and that is, what about politics? Is it good for a brand to be publicized by political events? <laughs> that's that's a little bit of a loaded question. It depends, right? It depends. Make your uh, brand great again. <laughs> yeah, Luke, what do you think about that? No, sorry to cut you off, the jury. I I, I think um, – I, I think it, it completely depends on the association and whether the association and type of visibility is good, right? Is it, anytime I think about an event or an association or partnership that we do for Lucid Press, uh, it, it's, okay, what, what does the brand we're partnering with mean to our audience? And uh, does, that, does that mean what I want our brand to mean? If it does, that's a great partnership. If it doesn't, I don't know that it is. And I would look at any political event that way. There are some brands where being associated uh, with a political brand or event can be great. There are others where it can't. And, uh, but, but I think with that kind of framework of treating it almost like any other partnership, uh, you, you can probably figure things out. Uh, it requires you to know your audience and, and what they want to hear. Uh, and often politics can be really divisive and controversial, which is why I think you see a lot of the mass brands, DPG and other, other groups, really, really try to shy away, I think, from a lot of politics because uh, they know that it can be divisive. Uh, but if you know and you have a targeted market and you know what they think and you know what you can be associated with, uh, maybe maybe it's a good thing. I, I would always advise proceed with caution. Just, you know, be careful. Not that it's wrong, but just be careful about doing it. Okay, well, I think we've, we're out of time. Uh, but we're out of time because we had so many great questions. If we, for any reason, didn't get to answer your question or answer it well enough, like I said, please reach out to us. Uh, I'm going to put back up on the screen some contact information for the folks at Lucid Press. Uh, there's a website and a Twitter handle, and uh, Luke has shared his Twitter handle as well, at Luke Langford. So we'd love to hear from you if you have further comments or questions. But thanks, everyone, for hanging in there with us today. We hope you found this valuable. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Take care.